It makes sense why our brain would automatically make associations between events. Like if you got sick after eating fish, your brain assumes it was caused by what you ate. This automatic association is advantageous for human survival. But our brain also makes unusual associations, like this woman on the TV show Maury who developed a fear of pickles. Or this woman who developed a fear of cotton balls. The subject of psychology helps explain why people make associations between positive and negative experiences and certain stimuli. In this Psychedemia episode, I explore classical conditioning, a type of associative learning that once began with Pavlov's dog, but now connects to everyday life. So how does classical conditioning work? To help you better understand this concept, let's start with fundamental ideas. The foundation of classical conditioning is a concept known as associative learning, in which we learn that two events occur together. We learn that seeing lightning in the distance will lead to a thunderous boom in a few seconds. We learn that hearing a specific ringtone implies you received a text. And from a young age, we learn that studying leads to academic success. In all these examples, two events become associated together. If you think about it, there is an evolutionary reason why our brains so easily associate two events together. Survival. If one of our earliest ancestors ate a toxic berry and got sick, for example, it's advantageous for our survival to make this connection quickly. For your own knowledge, developing an aversion to a particular food or taste because it led to a negative response, like vomiting, is called taste aversion, or the Garcia effect. This leads us to classical conditioning a type of associative learning where we learn to associate two stimuli together and thus anticipate events. Like in our previous example, because you associate lightning with thunder, you now anticipate the loud boom seconds before it happens. Before I provide examples of classical conditioning and discuss how the concept evolved in Pavlov's laboratory, let's get some key vocabulary out of the way. Foremost, when you hear the word unconditioned, think unlearned or involuntary. For example, you don't learn that a bee sting hurts, This is an involuntary response. Conversely, when you hear the word conditioned, think learned or acquired. For example, you may learn to fear the color yellow because of its association with bees. Okay, let's look at two example scenarios of classical conditioning to increase your understanding. In scenario one, kissing naturally causes arousal, which entails increased heart rate and deeper breathing. This will occur without learning. Accordingly, Kissing is the unconditioned stimulus that causes an unconditioned response of arousal. Remember, unconditioned implies unlearned. So, you don't learn that kissing increases heart rate and deepens breathing. This is a natural response. It just so happens that you kissed while a specific song was playing on the radio. You now notice that every time you hear that specific song on the radio, your heart rate increases and your breathing deepens. Feeling aroused in response to the song is learned. So, The song becomes the conditioned stimulus, and arousal becomes the conditioned response. We can now say that classical conditioning has occurred. Make sense? In the second scenario, you happen to eat a bad burger from McDonald's that led to a stomachache. Bad food will automatically cause sickness. So, the burger is the unconditioned stimulus, and the stomachache is the unconditioned response. A month later, you drove past McDonald's and immediately felt nauseous when you saw the big yellow arch. Feeling sick in response to the sign is learned. So, the sign becomes the conditioned stimulus, and feeling sick becomes the conditioned response. We can now say that classical conditioning has occurred. It is important to note that both the song and the McDonald's sign would never cause an automatic response before conditioning. Accordingly, we call this the neutral stimulus. We will return to this slide later on, but think of classical conditioning as a formula. There are three phases before conditioning, during conditioning, and after conditioning. Here is what the formula would look like filled in with our first scenario about kissing. Before we move on, pause the video here and check your understanding of classical conditioning. Read the scenario above and fill in the blanks. So, how'd you do? Here's a tip when problem solving. Always ask yourself, what would naturally cause a response and what is being associated with that response? Just as a reference, here's what the answer would be using the formula. The historical roots of classical conditioning occurred serendipitously, which means it was an accidental discovery, being in the right place at the right time. Ivan Pavlov was a Russian physiologist interested in studying the digestive system of dogs. He was never a psychologist per se. 
To study the digestive system, Pavlov put food in the dog's mouth to collect saliva. This is because food automatically leads to salivation. Saliva is produced to help break down food while chewing. However, Pavlov soon realized that the dog would salivate well before the food was placed in its mouth. The dog would salivate just looking at the food, at the sight of the food bowl, or even hearing people walk in the room. Pavlov realized that the dog was anticipating the food. Remember from our earlier discussion, Associative Learning? This is the initial breakthrough. To explore this phenomenon further, Pavlov and his associates set up a series of experiments. They decided to pair a random neutral stimuli, like a bell, with food. Pavlov wanted to know if he repeatedly paired the sound of a bell with food, bell food, bell food, bell food, would the dog salivate at the sound of the bell alone in anticipation? The answer, yes. Let's visualize this process above. The food is the unconditioned stimulus because it automatically causes an unconditioned response, salivation. Salivation at the sound of a bell is learned. Consequently, the sound becomes the conditioned stimulus, and salivation becomes the conditioned response. Here is our formula from earlier in this episode showcasing Pavlov's study. Notice the term acquisition. This represents the initial stage when a new behavior is learned. A number of salient questions began to emerge from Pavlov's work. Foremost, does the order and timing of presenting the neutral stimulus and unconditioned stimulus impact the strength of conditioning? Quite simply, yes. There are many factors that affect the strength of conditioning. Let's look at our four methods of conditioning from the most to least effective. The first method is delayed conditioning. This is the most effective and fastest way to condition a behavior. Delayed conditioning entails presenting the conditioned stimulus first and then introducing the unconditioned stimulus while the conditioned stimulus is still present. It's like presenting food while the bell is still ringing. The second method, which is less effective, is trace conditioning. This entails presenting the conditioned stimulus followed by a brief break and then present the unconditioned stimulus. The third method is simultaneous conditioning. This entails presenting the conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus at the same time. Lastly, there is backward conditioning, the least effective method of conditioning. Why? Because the unconditioned stimulus and conditioned stimulus are presented backwards. Another critical question that emerged from Pavlov's work is, can a learned behavior be unlearned? After acquisition, Pavlov found that if you stop pairing the conditioned stimulus with the unconditioned stimulus, the dog was less likely to salivate. The weakening of a conditioned response is called extinction. In Pavlov's study, this implies that the sound of a bell alone no longer causes the dog to salivate. However, when Pavlov waited several hours before sounding the bell again, the conditioned response reappeared, a concept called spontaneous recovery. Spontaneous recovery, or the return of the conditioned response after extinction, shows that the conditioned response was never forgotten, but merely suppressed. Classically conditioning Pavlov's dog is one famous study in the history of psychology. In another famous study, John Watson and Rosalie Rayner conditioned a boy, little Albert, to fear a white rat. Every time little Albert touched the white fluffy rat, the researchers produced a loud, scary noise. After several trials, little Albert wanted nothing to do with that animal. Little Albert also became fearful of similar stimuli, a concept called generalization, like a white rabbit, a white beard, and a white fluffy coat. Here's our formula from earlier in this Psychedemia episode showcasing Watson and Rayner's study. Pavlov's legacy lives on today. The concept of classical conditioning can be seen in advertising and pop culture. Take a look at this scene from the TV show The Office. I have to reboot again. Hey, Dwight, do you want an Altoid? What do you think? Dwight, one Altoid. Okay. Altoid? Sure. What are you doing?